first Métis were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michif, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. A sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first prime minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16th. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. All right, Darlene, well, thank you for joining us uh, and being a part of the Northeast BC storytelling, rather Métis storytelling project. And um, this project is geared towards uh, sharing wisdom and teachings from elders or anyone that's First Nations that has wonderful stories to pass on. And um, we do this and we record them so that future generations and other Métis uh, citizens can someday watch this and hopefully learn many things that they perhaps didn't know and hopefully be able to relate to many of these things and who knows maybe it'll want it'll lead them to um, to want to join the Métis societies across Canada okay so let's start off with your full name so what is your full name? Uh, Darlene Elsie Cardinal. Cardinal okay yes. now is that your married name or your maiden name? Maiden name I was never married Okay, fair enough. And uh, can you tell me about uh, your family, I guess, your background, so the Cardinal, is that from your mom then? Um, no, that was my dad. Okay. Yeah, my dad um, came and got me from Chetwin, BC. Back then it was called Little Prairie. When I was three years old, my mom said, you know, gave, gave me back, to, gave me to my dad. And then my dad, in return, gave me to my auntie, which was his, which is his sister. And she raised me. And where was that? And that was in Fort Nelson. But I was born in Gruard, Alberta, where I always thought I was born in High Prairie. It was just last year that I found out I was born in Gruard. And I says, how could I be born in Gruard? There's no hospital there. They said, well, you had a, you had a midwife. A midwife delivered you. And I thought, oh, my God, that is something. And how did you so, find that out? Well, I, I went to get my birth certificate in... Um, in um, Edmonton and I told him I was born in High Prairie and they said no you weren't born in High Prairie you're born in Gruard so then I asked my brother who lives in Chetwin well how did how was I born in Gruard when there's no no but there is no doctors no hospital he said well mom you had mom had a midwife and she came your mom went into labor this lady came along and delivered you I said well for goodness sakes so I, I never ever knew that until last year when I got my birth certificate. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Okay, so then what brought your mom to Chetwin? Do you, do you know? I think... Or I guess your parents at that time? I think my mom and dad had split up then. Okay. And uh, she moved to uh, Chetwin with myself and my, my two brothers and my sister. Okay. And uh, that's where she resided until the passing when she passed away in a car accident going to High Prairie her and my little brother passed away in that car accident and so was it on both sides of your uh, family that you had that you have Métis heritage yes both sides okay so your dad's cardinal what's your mom's maiden my name mom's la my, my mom's name was Alice Callahasen and there's a lot of there was a lot of Callahasens in in um, Chetwin, but they're, uh, the most of them that I live there right now are Kutres, the Kutres. Actually, Alan is my- uh, Current mayor. Is, is our current mayor, and he's married to my 
for my first cousin's sister, uh, Diane. So she'd be called her the first lady and the, <laughs> and the president of Chapman. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. So how old were you um, while you were, like, how long did you live for in Chatwin as a child? Do you remember? I think I was only there till I was like three years old. So I don't know how, how old I was when I, we were, I was taken, we moved there. I don't know. But I, all I know is I was three years old when my dad came to get me. So it wasn't very many years. Gotcha. So then you went to, uh, where was it with your, your, your dad came and got you, took you to your aunt. We lived, we lived in Fort St. John briefly. And then he took me to Fort Nelson, and that's how Fort Nelson became my hometown. Okay, gotcha. And that's where you, did you go to elementary yes, school? Yes, I went to elementary school and high school. And, Amen. Yeah. Okay. And um, I, you were saying, you know, that growing up, your mom never shared with you um, any of the experiences that she had with residential school. No. Um, you were sharing this with me before we yes. got the interview started, but then you told me that, you know, it wasn't until in her, like, was it her last few years that yes. she told you that? Can you tell me a bit about that? Well, she used to tell me as I was growing up when she was teaching me how to peel potatoes and carrots and that, well, I would just peel a whole bunch of the skin off and she'd say, oh my goodness, my girl, you know, if you were in, in the mission where I was, she said, you would get your hands hit with the ruler so many times that your knuckles would swell up and I'd say, like, why? And she said, because you had to peel those, those um, potatoes where you can just about see them, they had to be transparent practically. And I says, oh my God. And she said, and it wasn't just a little five pound potato. She said, we had 100 pound gunny sacks of potatoes and we would have to sit there and um, peel them. And if you didn't peel them, you'd sit there and peel potatoes until you learned how. And I think she said they were like five years old when they started teaching them. Yeah, and then, you know, these, and it was all wooden floors and they had to use just a scrub brush on hands and knees. And yeah, she said it was a very, very hard life. Yeah. Did she go through like the whole, I guess, through all the grades or did she get out a bit earlier? Uh, she went in there when she, she was born in 1910. She went in to um, the Gruard Mission at age four. And she didn't get out till she was 16. And my great grandmother went to get her out. And by that time, they had already, at 13, had sterilized her and told her that there's not to be any more uh, savage Indians brought back into this world. So what we're doing to you is to have no more babies. So it, it was terrible. She said there was a lot of girls that, that happened to them. And she said some she never, ever saw again. And so she said they don't know if she was, they were buried out there or maybe they were thrown in the lake because a lot of times the priests would go way out to the middle of Slave Lake and she doesn't know, she says, but I know there was a lot of bad things that happened there. I'm sorry to hear that. And um, I, I never, I never really t looked at it that way that when I was growing up that each time I was, she was teaching me something, she was telling me about what was happening to her when she was in the mission school. And when you're young, you don't really pay attention. You say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then it was only like last year or two years ago when they found the missing children in Kamloops that it really hit home that what she was telling me, this is what happened, this is what was happening. And you know, a lot of the children were born from, were brought into this world by the priests and so they had to get rid of the children because that wasn't allowed. And so that is why there were so many, you know, children gone and parents didn't know because they, they, they took the kids away from them. Yeah, and they weren't, you know, they never, <laughs> I remember when I was a little girl in Fort Nelson, she used to always just cut my hair really like this, like a bowl, and it would be just crooked. But that is how they got their hair cut in, in, um, in the mission. So. Through the years, I never ever had long hair because their long hair was all chopped off. So never did I ever have long hair. Wow, the things that stick with people. Yeah, she never, you know, and she used to use cans. She said she'd cut the cans of a, of a can of peas or something, cut them, and she'd use white pieces of sheet 
in strips and she'd curl my hair with that. So I'd have all these little white things on my hair and I was dark. So can you imagine me running around in Fort Nelson with all these little, <laughs> you know, I think about it now and I'd laugh, but you know, we were just little girls, little kids back then. And, and I didn't really know what discrimination was or until I hit about grade eight. And then it became harder for, for me because there wasn't a lot of Native children, Métis children that I didn't know I was Métis, that went to a public school because they already had schools at the, at the reserves and most of the kids went there. So when we went, when I went, along with the other, we were picked on a lot. And so I think it was halfway through grade eight that I didn't want to go anymore because I just couldn't take the abuse and the teasing and and we were poor, we were poor, so, you know, the clothes I had was what my mom would make me or people would give their hand-me-downs to my mom and kids would notice that I had their clothes on and they said, that's my sweater, or my top, I want it back, give it to me and I would have to give it to them, right? And it was, it was very hard, so it kind of made you shy to be a native, like mm -hmm. you didn't want to be native, but you were and you didn't really know how to understand that. And, Wow. Now, did your dad share something? Did he go to residential school as well or no? No. My dad, my dad went to residential school very briefly, and then he ran away from it when he was 16. Okay. And he joined the Army at 16. He lied about his age. You're supposed to join at 19. But he told them he was, he was 19, and he was only 16, but he was tall. So he went to war at 16. Wow. Yeah, and it was sad. He's young. He went all over Germany, England, France. Oh, yeah. that's too bad. Did he come back for more? Yeah, he came back. He never did talk about it, you know, but you could see the sadness and the hurt, but he never did talk about about the war. Yeah. You know, I mean, I can imagine at 16 years old and you have to go out there and shoot and- It's no easy thing to do. And save your life and- So, okay, maybe we won't talk about that, but what I did want to ask you about was, okay, so in grade eight, you know, that was already tough, but back home, what was it like back home uh, with your auntie and, and, and that family, and I guess in, in that family, what was it like? Oh, it was great. I mean, even though she was raised in a mission school, she never took no anger or called me down. She raised me and, you know, she teased me and and everything, and if I wanted a pair of nylons, I mean, nylons back then, you had to clip them on, right? And my legs were so skinny, but because I'd cry for these nylons, she put them on me, but they would just wave like in the, in the wind. <laughs> but, you know, I was so proud that I could wear these. <laughs> yeah, but I had a really good childhood, you know. They bought, she got me a bike the best that she could, and she didn't like it that I, you know, we had to walk to school because we lived way far, far. We lived on a dump road, which would be about a mile and a half from the high school, and it would be about two miles then from G.W. Carlson. Wow. And we ha I had to walk there in the winter. And back then, the winters were like 45, 50 below, and it was cold. So I would stop at the Ford Hotel and warm up there, and then I'd keep on going. And then I think it was about grade, grade six or seven, they started having the bus pick us up, the ones that were coming down from 308. But that was still about five block walk to catch the bus. But it was good. But it was it, it was a hard life, you know. We had to we had to have our own garden. We didn't have running water, so we had to haul our own water. We had snow water in the winter and in the spring that we'd we'd have a great big barrel and and she'd have a a sheet wrapped around a barrel and we'd catch rainwater, and that would be our bath water and. To wash your hair and we'd only be allowed to have a bath twice a week on a Wednesday and a Sunday and there was two of us so my sister would go my younger sister who was really my cousin was also raised by mom would have a bath first and then I would so and then mom did laundry and she used the same tub to rinse the clothes off so that was you know our her washing board tub and that was our bathtub yeah, so it, it was a hard life. We had to pick berries and check out the garden, and I had to chop wood and haul, haul, haul snow in, throw the chamber pail away. I hated that. I forget what it was called back then. 
She called it something else, but first then she said it was a chamber pail, and then she called it something else that was called in the uh, mission school, but I can't quite remember what it's called. And for someone who's never had to deal with a chamber pail, can you tell us what it is? Oh my God, it's a pail that when you have, when you have to go in the, to the bathroom, you'd go in there and then there's a cover, you'd cover it. And then when it starts to get full, well, you pack it outside to the toilet and dump it in the toilet. Then you come back and you have to wash it and put, put um, this, um, what is it, uh, pine salt. And I used to hate that pine salt. Oh my God, the smell. So of course, when I went to camp, as I got older, like I went to camp, well, some of these guys would use pine salt. So you'd go in there and they'd wash the floors and the smell, it was just like, oh my God, I hated the smell of pine salt. But now they got different kinds of, you know, that smells a lot nicer than the regular one, but the regular one was wicked and I hated that pine salt. <laughs> yeah, but that's what we used. You know, you had to use whatever it was. So yeah, that's what it was. It was a chamber pill, but it was a honey, honey something, I think it was called. I forget what, honey something was what that chamber pill was called. So your auntie, which you were telling me about, um, who uh, helped raise you and all yes. that. Did she talk about her earlier years um, as a First Nations woman and what it was like for her? Yes. Well, she was raised, she was taken away from my grandma and grandpa, so I, I, it was a very early, she was only four years old and she didn't understand nothing. She never taught me how to talk Cree because you weren't allowed to talk in native tongue. So she never did teach me how to talk Cree. So you never spoke it at home? I don't know how to speak Cree to this day. I understand a few words, but I don't know. No, she never, she wasn't, wasn't allowed. And um, I still went to church on Sunday, even though she was, ra she was raised in the mission. I still went to school. I still made my, went to Sunday school. I still made my first communion. And, and it was good, she said, because she said, it wasn't the church's fault, she said. That was the house of God, she said, it wasn't. The mission school is where it was bad, where the priests and the nuns did bad, bad things. And then the church on Sunday, when they all took the kids, was a place to ask for help or for forgiveness. And she said she'd ask steady, help me, help me get out of here. It's, it's, it's hard, it's hard. And, you know, and they can't tell the nuns or the priests what they asked for it's because they would get hit with the, a ruler. I mean, not a ruler, it's a stick. And they said it really, really hurt. And, and uh, the only thing that makes me really, really sad is that of all the Métis children that went to these, to these residential schools and mission schools, they weren't asked back then if they were Métis. If your skin was brown, you're going to that residential school. So now, now that they're coming out and they're paying all this money to the children that belong in the reserves, that's federal, they're paying them all this money for the pain and the sorrow that they went through. Well, what about the Métis people? What about the ones that went there and they felt the same thing? Some of them were, were tortured. My mom was sterilized at 13 not to have any children of her own. And the government still won't acknowledge it. Like, there is something wrong there. What do we do? How do we, how do we go about saying, no, this is not right? Like I know again now, there, and, and it was the same thing as, as um, they, they call it a federal school, like res, uh, they go to the res, reservation school. It was called day school. They're gonna get paid money for that because the teachers were white and they tormented them too. Well, what about us? When we went to a regular school, we were also called down. You and guys were down. bullied and all sorts yes. of other nasty things. Yes, yes. And told like, why aren't we at the reserve? You're just, you know, you're just a dirty Indian. Look at you and you know, we don't want you here. That's too bad. Yeah, but my mom always made sure I had brand new clothes when I went to school. Christmas, I mean, first day of school, I went to, at Christmas time. And then I had my Sunday clothes, you know, to go to church and we used to wear the little hat. And, and then I'd take my Sunday school clothes off and put them away till the next Sunday. And 
<laughs> you know, so I had a good childhood considering she was from, she was raised right till she was 16, taken out. She didn't, she wasn't mean to me. She didn't hit me. She, she taught me how to pray and to forgive and not to be mean to other people. You know, and mom had a hard life, like, you know, she, when she took us, she was already poor. Like she, she, she took in laundry from the RCMP, from Bobby Keene, he owned a big company. And he, she would do laundry to make extra money to, to raise us, like to, to get us what we need. But back then I didn't think I was poor, you know. We, we always ate and, you know, we had, a, we had everything. We had wild berries to eat, if, you know, and that was our treat. We got to go to the show all the time. We had a quarter and a quarter back then. My God, you go to the show, you could buy a pop, a bag of, a bag of popcorn, a chocolate bar, and a few of those little candies. And, you know, you're, it was good, you know, for a quarter. You know, I, I used to go babysitting for 25 cents. First, it was only 10 cents. But back then, you know, you didn't think of it because, you know, it was, money was, money didn't really matter at that time for us. So only if we got to go to the show, then it was a great thing. Or just like screaming, you know, when the, the uh, lion used to come out, I forget, and oh, everybody would just scream. It was like, you know, and I love watching Jerry Lee Lewis, the Three Stooges, and I watch it now on, on TV, like I go YouTube it and I think, like, what was so funny about that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> how would I'm saying yeah, that? You know, but it was funny. Um, now, were there any traditions that growing up you guys did uh, from your Métis background that you guys still, maybe that you still do to this day? My dad taught me how to jig. Okay. We won, we won two jigging contests in Fort Nelson. I started jigging when I was five. I mean, I'm not the greatest now, but yeah, we, we did the Red River jig and we, we did this jig, I don't know what it was called, it was like a train. So you're moving your feet and as, as it gets faster, you're speeding up and then you're just going. And yeah, so that was the one tradition of uh, Métis is, is the jigging because Métis is jigging and country music and I did, um, um, square dancing, and that's also a Métis tradition. Gotcha. Yeah, and then picking berries and and canning, and we did that. I did. We didn't make dry meat. She never made dry meat. We got it from the reserve because we know a lot of people, and they'd make dry meat. But we didn't. She didn't teach me how to make dry meat. Okay. But um, we knew how to pick berries. We knew what berries was, and we knew some of the plants that you know, that could heal you. I used to hate the spruce gum. If you got a cut, like you cut, you cut yourself with a knife and it bleed, you go and get some spruce gum off the, off, the, off the tree and you chew it and chew it and chew it until it turns pink. You put that on your, your cut and wrap it up, take it off about a week later or so, there's no, there's no, no scar. Wow, I've never heard of that. But your mouth is so sore from making that gum turn pink. Oh, man. <laughs> it's been years and years since I did that, but it was like a little girl, maybe seven, eight years old, and I chew that, and it was like, oh my God, why do I gotta do that? And they said, well, you know, your dad's got a cut, so you gotta make it, yeah. And or else they put pep, tobacco. I don't know why, for some reason, it was always tobacco that they put on their- Really, on their cut? Sword, their cut too, so I don't know if that was, Métis tradition or if it was, but yeah. But I never knew I was Métis. I always thought I was first, I was uh, non-status. Oh, gotcha. So every time somebody would ask me, I'd say non-status and they'd say, no, you're not, you're not non-status. Métis only came about when I moved to Fort St. John. Then I knew what Métis, well, I didn't even know what Métis was, but they told me you're Métis because you don't belong to reserve. You don't have, you don't belong to a colony we're just like the lost people. The reserves don't want us, the white people don't want us. We're here and yet we pay taxes and everything else, but we have like no rights. Now it's slowly coming that we get hunting rights, fishing and, but um, money-wise, like not for myself, but for the people, 
the Métis people that went to residential school, I find in my heart that they should get what is deserved to them. And I know when my mom got sterilized at 13, she applied, they come and told her when she was about uh, 80 years old that she could apply and get a lawyer to get up to a million dollars for being sterilized. But by the time it, the paperwork and everything went through, she passed away at 82, and it doesn't go down to her children that she raised. It, the government kept it. So, That's crazy. Yeah. And it was too bad because, you know, if, if we knew that years ago when she was younger, and the, you know, that she could have got that money. Much sooner. Yeah. My one auntie, Rita Fian, got it. Yeah, she got 75000 I think it was. Wow. Yeah, so. That's just the fact that it even, all yeah. that happened. You know, just the fact that there's so many women sterilized that couldn't have children, and that was taken away from them, and to be called a savage all the time. You're a savage, you're not going to bring no more savages into this world. It was sad. And she used to tell me all these stories, and I sit back and think about it now, and you know, I could see the hurt in her face, and I wouldn't really understand, and yeah. So I think you were saying um, later on, though, you yourself didn't get married, right? No. But did you have children? Yeah, I have four sons. Four sons? Yeah. Oh, wow. Four sons. And where are they? Uh, three, li three live here, and one lives in High Prairie. Elvis is my oldest. He's 47. Daniel is 45, Jamie's 41, and Billy is 40. Okay. And what was it like to, uh, to raise them? Well, actually, I raised them all on my own after a while. I had a very, very, very hard life. I had a, uh, uh, a monster. He was a monster. He killed my sister in 1997. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And he tried to kill me numerous times when I'd run away and get away from him. The last time he got, I got away was in Red Deer, and he caught up to me, and he hit me over the head with a baseball bat, and he cut my head open. So these two fingers saved my life. I put my fingers in there and covered it up and went to the hospital, and he got, he got a choice. You either leave her alone or you'll go to jail. Where It should have been you leave her alone and you go to jail. But no, he said, okay, I'll leave her alone. But he always said, I'll get back at you. And somehow he got to my sister, who was Sandra. And he raped and murdered her and went through Rat Ma 100. And sit back and sit back and listen to us, looking for her, seeing what he, how he could help us. And it was him. It was him all the time. So I got a picture of my sister. Oh, do you? Yes, I got a picture of her. Wow, look at that. Yes. So. Oh my goodness. She was 44 when... 53 to 1997? Yeah, yeah. She was murdered. And I sprayed her ashes on the old Hudson Hope Road. They blocked it off, but there's that sharp corner where you go. And she used to just love it up there. So I spread her ashes there because by the time we found my sister, there wasn't very much left of her. So I thought, well, look. She, and she hated bugs. She said, don't ever, don't ever put me in the ground. I hate bugs and she hated everything. And yet with my sister it was so funny. Every time we go on a picnic or something, she never ever wore running shoes. She always wore high heels. So we'd be going in there and you'd see these little holes in there and say, what's that? And that would be Sandra's high heels walking around <laughs> at the picnic. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. And so your son, you said, so you say th said three, right? Four. Four. Did you pass on any uh, Métis traditions or any anything uh, that was passed down to you to them? Well, I, I passed down to my older son. Well, he knows how to sing. He sings, and uh, he jig. They jig. Two of them jig. Uh, the other ones I didn't really I didn't really teach them because by then I was only six, I was only sixteen years old when I finally got with that monster and. He started beating me up at 16, so I didn't know a lot of things. I didn't have a lot of friends. He kept me in 101, and, and you know, he said, put your head down. I put my head down, and I, I, I was so mis 
malfunctioned. I didn't know nothing. When I finally ran with, away with my sons, I used to ask them, can I go over here? Can I go over there? I'm just going to go to the store. I'll be back in 10 minutes because I used to have a time limit. If you're not back here, you're going to get it. Well, it was very, very, very hard. So that was quite the adjustment then when yes. you finally were able to move and get away from that. And, and you know, I used to tell my sons, don't ever hit, don't ever hit your wives or your girlfriends because if you do, I will be hitting you first because I know how it feels. So don't ever hit them. And thank God they don't hit their wives. Good. Yeah. I said, walk away because, yeah, yeah you don't need to do that. Um, now, when you finished school, you said you went right into the workforce, is that? Well, no, I, I didn't go into the workforce until, oh my goodness. I used to go dishwash. I dishwashed in Fort Nelson first. That was my first job when I was 14. I went, and then I tried a waitress. Well, oh my God, these businessmen came in there and they all ordered breakfast. So now I'm trying to go out there and give them their plates. So as I'm putting that one plate down, the eggs and everything fell on that guy's <laughs> suit. I was so embarrassed. I cried. I said, I'm so sorry. And he kept on saying, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. It can be washed. It can be dry cleaned. So that was the end. I only did it that once, and that was it. I wasn't ever going to waitress again. And I never did. <laughs> so then what did you do? So then I, I dishwashed. I, I waitressed just that once. And then I went into um, housekeeping. Oh, no, it was hard work. My fingers used to just bleed and, and you know, housekeeping in town in a motel is the hardest work. And I did that for quite a few years. And then finally, I went to camp and I became, I cleaned rooms there and they were called campies back then, but now they're called housekeepers. And um, I did that for a long time and then I got promoted to uh, to uh, become head housekeeper. So I didn't really do a lot of making beds and everything. I just went and checked on my the ladies and helped them out if they needed anything. And whoever came, I, I'd show them what to do. And then after that, I became a manager. Well, the manager was a different story. Oh, my goodness. Michelle, I said, I don't know how to manage. I said, what do you mean? going to manage. She said, yes, you are. We're going to teach you. How are you going to teach me? I'm over in camp and you guys are over. We're going to teach you over the phone. <laughs> so I had these stickies all over the place because I now I have to learn how to talk on that phone. You know, good afternoon. This is on site one and we're over at kilometer 33. If you're looking for this camp. Well, I didn't know that. I used to say, hello, what you do? Hello, how can I help you? <laughs> You know, but I learned that, you know, so I stayed, I was a camp manager for seven years. Wow. And then I got attacked in camp by this girl that was on crystal meth. Because years ago, you could come to, you could go to camp and there's drinking. You could drink, do whatever. And so she came to camp and I didn't know anything about drugs. I mean, I knew about, you know, how they would look if you're drinking and, yeah. and that, but drugs, I did not know. So when she was flipping out, I thought, well, what is the matter with this woman like she's really losing it so i told her you know i don't know what's the matter with you but i gotta send you home well then she really flipped and which i shouldn't have but i did but i didn't know and so when i told michelle she's got to go there's something wrong with her and she said okay well the truck's going out there with the groceries today with somebody else well before they could get out there she she came out of her room when i was telling the housekeepers just stay in your room until she's gone because She's, God only knows what she's doing. She's so mad. So when she saw me, she attacked me. And she got, she got me with a power head of the vacuum. So she hit all the back of my head. And now I've got chipped bones back there where I go to um, Edmonton every four months to get um, Corazon and Botox put in my neck. So the pain isn't, as bad. isn't bad and the headaches get really, really bad, and I got uh, vertigo from it too. Oh my goodness. So when she did that, I stayed in the hospital for a month because my legs shut down. And then uh, she broke, I had to wear glasses because she got me in the face and she broke my teeth. So WCB had to pay for my teeth, which was $14,000 because now I didn't have no bone structure. So they had to do, so they had to do 
all kinds of work to keep my teeth in my mouth. So it must have been so painful. Oh, it was painful. It was very painful. You couldn't even eat. Oh, man. For six months, for the first month, you could only drink uh, broth. You couldn't even use a straw. You had to use a... So I lost a lot of weight then. But I just put it back on as fast as I lost it when, <laughs> when it was over. But, you know, that's okay. But And then after that, I, I tried to go back to work, but I couldn't remember what I, what I learned. I couldn't remember how to do spreadsheets. I couldn't remember how to match my books with the office and the consultants. And I was steadily phoning and asking them, how do you do this in? How do you? And I'm still doing that today. Like, they'll teach me something on the phone, and I'll say, okay, oh, yeah, yeah. And I'll remember, and I'll fit, play around with it, put it down, and I forget. So now they're going to have to teach me again when I go next week to Busy Bodies. They'll teach me again. And uh, so, yeah, so it, it was a really, really hard life. And then that was in 2007, and I never did work after that. I couldn't work. No, oh, I'd be very and difficult. I was on WCB right till I turned 65. And then at 65, they cut you off. Where years ago, if you got hurt, before 1981, I think it was, you stayed on WCB right till the day you died. But now they changed it to, and it's the same thing with, uh, uh, you couldn't sue the company for them bringing people people in without <coughs> giving them an interview, you can't sue them because they're protected by WCB. So there's a lot of things that WCB interferes with and a lot of people have a hard time with them. I remember going to WCB in Vancouver. They met me at the door. The security guard took me to the doctor's office, picked me up, took me back to the door and locked it because there was so, so much. So many people not liking them for what to do, and so many people still fighting to get help from years, years ago, but they won't, they won't justify it. Our doctors say this is their problem. They got it all written down, x-rays, and they got their doctors, and their doctors are saying no, 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 which is a sad, sad thing, and it's still happening. That is sad. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, so then when did you, uh, I guess, you know, we'll, we'll fast forward maybe to more present day. When did you become part of the uh, Métis Society? Well, actually, I was part of the Métis Society for uh, many years. I was when Jean Peerless was first on the Métis. Oh, the first one was um, Lawrence Goulet. I think he started it. And then from there, I went to Jean Peerless and, all, and others and others. So that was, oh, my God, in the 70s. Yeah, in the 70s. So, and did you just get involved with different community projects back then? Yeah. The Métis Society? Well, I was I was on the board, many boards for Métis Society, and then I I just kind of went off after I got hurt. Then I went back on it a couple of years ago. No, in 2017. But then by then, my son, youngest son, needed a kidney transplant, so then I had to get off the go off the board because I had to live in Vancouver with him for a year and a half. And now I'm back on it, back with them, and you know things are really looking up. And she's she's got good plans in the future with Jacqueline, and she does her best. She's awesome being with uh, the Métis Society. She's done more for the Métis Society than than anybody else that's been on it. You know, to get money wise from MBC and MNBC is is a big struggle. You know, so. Right now, we're very fortunate that we have that. And they bought a house. It's, I forget what the house is called here, but they haven't been able to use it yet. So hopefully in the future, we're hoping that the office here can move over there. And there's, you know, there's more room there and more things can be done because right now, when we have our board meeting like tonight, we have, we're going to busy bodies to have it there because there's not enough room in here to have eight people, 10 people, so. Okay, and who would you say uh, growing up or at any point in your life uh, was, uh, you know, um, influential or someone that you looked up to? 
Well, I really looked up to Ben Cardinal. He was no relation, but he 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 had he had a lot of wisdom. He wasn't Métis, but he was truly from uh, Big Stone Band in in, um, in uh, Wabasca. But he lived here all his life. He was a native court worker. Okay. And I also looked up to Arlene Lovelcan because she had a lot of knowledge. And who who is she? She she's a Métis Métis. She's an elder now. She's Maybe she's in her early 80s, mm -hmm. and uh, she knows a lot of, she used to be like a lawyer, I think, and she, she worked for the government and that, and she, she knows a lot of stuff. Wow. And so we learned from her, where I'm just starting to learn about the, uh, the, new, the um, sage and what you can do with it to... to uh, yeah, for accounting. Yeah, and uh, the teas, we're learning about the teas, what you can, you know, what leaves you can have and mix them and you can make tea with it. I knew about the sap because that was the only thing my my mom and dad taught me is got through the sap. That's the only thing I knew. And um, she used to tell me about the lettuce a long time ago, the ones that grow grow off the ground, like in the, between the sidewalks and that. She said that, that, was, that was edible. And it's still edible. So I used to say, really, mom? So I, because I used to, when I was a little girl, I used to, pretend you make salads, you pull everything out of the, you know, the earth and you make salads and she said, you could eat that, you could eat that, but I never did, but there was a couple times after a while I did, like, you know, find it out in, out in the bush someplace, but you wouldn't find it, I wouldn't suggest you eat it off your sidewalks and that. No. <laughs> yeah, but it does, it does taste good. So yes. have you kept any, to this day, are there certain traditions that you yourself keep alive or any things that you do, like, you still pick berries? Or oh yeah, we still pick berries, but it's getting harder and harder now because the towns expand so much. It's, you gotta go further and further away. And you know, and they've wrecked everything. And so and now when you go, you gotta carry a gun or something. Well, if you don't know how to shoot, well. I When I was younger, I used to go hunting for beaver and link. I tried to cut my first beaver, but I'd make too many little holes so I wouldn't make very much money. And uh, we, and if it, the beaver sunk, we used to have this great big long pole, and there's a thing, a hook at the end of it, and you jab it down in the, into the river, and if you felt it, you drag it back up, and it was heavy, so I'd just pull and pull and pull at it. Well, yeah, so it was, and then you'd sit there like, it was like early, early in the morning when they came out, or towards about 6 o'clock, 6.30, you'd go out again and, and try to get them, shoot them with your 22. So I could do that. I haven't shot a gun for a long time. I, I tried a 30-30 once when, at New Year's when you got to fire up. Well, that 30-30 just sent me flying and dislocated my shoulder. So that was the end of that. But now they said you could buy a gun, you can go hunting and it doesn't jump back anymore. The kickbacks on Yeah. Them. So, but I don't know if I'd try that, but I used to own 22s. Yeah, I, I really like them, but I first learned on a slingshot how to uh, shoot the peri chicken because they're so crazy. I mean, they just sit, stand there and you're, they're waiting for you to, sh <laughs> and then finally you get them and you, sk you know, skin them. So that is still a, um, a tradition that you can go peri, hunt, peri chicken hunting or you go rabbit hunting. There's no more rabbits anymore yet, but we used to eat wild rabbits and wild prairie chickens and that's nice. Yeah, so that that was our tradition. My dad taught us that. Wow. Yeah. That is that's awesome that you still even carried a little bit of that. Yeah, I still do that, but I learned that on from the from my slingshot. <laughs> from your slingshot days. Um, now you talked about you know different times in your life where you know things got very difficult. What would you say has helped you through that? Has it been faith or has it just been family? What would you say? I think. When I went through my rough, rough times, back then people don't want to help you even though they, you're getting beat up and that, and they were scared, like they didn't want to interfere and, and it was no big thing. And I would ask for help and, you know, and ask his mom and dad and they'd say, oh, just, you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting beat up and screaming and crying and nobody would do anything. And it was, it was very, very hard. So I used to pray to God every day. I, I mean, I. But, you know, I used to pray to God, please, please kill him. Please, please let him die, you know. But he never, he never did. And um, 
So finally, I had to teach myself how to drive. And then I, I used to have to plan how I'm going to get away. But I knew I couldn't get away without, without learning how to drive. So the, the time I got away is I packed up all the clothes and said, I'm going to the laundromat. So he said, okay, I'll give you an hour and a half. So in an hour and a half, I was past Dawson. He just about caught up to me when I hit Red Deer. And I was thinking it was a day or two later, he stayed around and he caught up to me and that's when he got me with the baseball bat. But um, that, was the end of, that was the end of him. Like he's evil, evil. He raped so many women in this town. He raped so many women there and killed my sister. And yet, he only got 15 months. Like that was the, you know, I couldn't, under, I couldn't believe it. I said, all the women that came here and testified of what he did to them, they came forward. I said, and he only gets 15 months. It's like he just given those girls a slap in the face. But back then we were blamed for everything. We we're blamed for everything. We got raped or is there some trying to, it's your fault. It's, and today, it's still, they're trying to do that, but I'm praying, hopefully, that, you know, it will get better. I know in the States, it's starting to get better, but in Canada, you can still kill somebody, rape somebody, and you don't get much time. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. You know, there's at least 20 women here that's been raped and murdered. There's still at least 10 that are missing, and that's from 1997. Yeah, and it was just recently, a couple of years ago, that this woman got killed with her baby in the house. So it, it's very, very sad. That's too bad. Yeah, that is sad. Um, okay, well, um, that being said, you know, after all, all the great stories you told me, um, if uh, anyone were to, you know, watch this, and at the end uh, they'd want to hear a message, what would you want to, what message would you want to relay to them? I would ask them to, like, you know, if, if you see violence against women, please, please help them. Like, you know, you can't help them, call the RCMP or call the hotline and say this one is getting abused. Could you, you know, go check up on her and try and help them as much as you can because the more help we get from the police, ourselves, because we're a part of the community, they need help. They're never going to ask for it because they are scared. We have to get involved. So please, you know, help everybody out there that, that needs help. And I hope my storytelling to you brings some wisdom. I, I, it isn't good to be in, in a violent relationship. If you can get out, get out because it doesn't get any better. You just go through a honeymoon stage and it's right back to square one. No matter if you lost five, six kids, there's still hope out there. I did it with four. I slept and ate on the floor. We only had, we only had a little 12 inch TV, but my sons and me were happy. We slept on the floor. And then we got welfare furniture, which was made like cardboard, but we were happy with that. But you know, we were still free and, and, and it felt good. It made, it scares you, your heart is beating all the time, you're terrified, but down the road, you get stronger and stronger and stronger, where after a while, you're not gonna let no man dominate you.